On April 6, 1994, diving legend Sheck Exley was attempting to break the diving depth record in the Zakatone sinkhole when something went horrifyingly wrong. This is his story. Today's video is sponsored by Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. If you're a longtime subscriber, you probably know I'm Canadian, and in case you didn't know, French is mandatory in schools here because it's one of our official languages. Unfortunately, after being out of school for some time, I'd forgotten so much of my once decent French vocabulary. This was honestly a bit of a bummer because of how much time and effort it took to learn French, and as you might imagine, not at all helpful in a country where a good chunk of the population is French speaking. This is why I was super excited to work with Babbel when they reached out. Babbel's lessons are all designed by real language teachers, so the lessons have you go through several ways to learn the same concepts, like matching words with definitions, spelling words out, using the correct grammar, and even practicing your pronunciation just like this. Faire de la plongée. Faire de la plongée. So not only does Babbel speed up the learning process and enable you to have real-world conversations, but it's actually a fun way to learn, which makes it that much easier to go through the lessons. And even better, when I'm on the go, I can do all of the lessons conveniently from the Babbel app on my phone. So, with the holidays coming up, if you've got someone who's hard to buy for, Babbel might be the perfect gift. Or, you could even gift yourself a Babbel subscription, because right now, Babbel is offering 60% off a subscription, and this comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So there's no risk in giving it a try, with the link in the description below. On June 29th, 1968, Sheck and Edward Exley pulled into the parking lot of one of their favorite swimming spots. It was another of Florida's many hot summer days, and Wakulla Springs, located about 14 miles south of Tallahassee, was always a good place to get some relief. The Exley brothers weren't just your average teenagers looking to cool off with a swim, though. At only 19, Sheck was starting to become known around dive shops in the area as a bit of a phenom. The local dive community even talked about him like he was some sort of myth, with claims that he could extend the life of an air tank longer than any human on Earth, or that he could leisurely descend to depths that the average diver would pass out at. Hearing divers talk about Sheck was like listening to a fisherman telling the story of his biggest catch, only each time he tells it, the fight gets a little tougher and the fish gets a little bigger. And the two brothers' trips to Wakulla Springs probably played a bit of a role in building his reputation at such a young age. There are signs in the parking lot of Wakulla Springs that warn that scuba diving is strictly prohibited, so this is where the brothers would come to free dive instead and test their limits. During their swims, the brothers would take turns seeing how deep they could get on a single breath hole before the need for air forced them to rocket back to the surface. That day though, Sheck had a new piece of equipment he was excited to test out. He bought a depth gauge that was worn on the wrist and now these competitions with his brother would have official measurements. After they eased into the warm water of Wakulla Springs, Sheck and Edward swam out to the deeper areas. One of them would then dive down with the depth gauge and then return to the surface before handing the gauge off to the other. Sheck always let Edward go first, and each time his brother returned to the surface, Sheck would take the gauge and go just a little bit deeper. When Edward logged 42 feet, Sheck came back with a reading of 50 feet. But, determined to finally get the better of his older brother, Edward took several deep, fast breaths before filling his lungs to capacity and slipping under the water. At the surface, Sheck watched as Edward descended and knew immediately when he passed his previous mark. Sheck estimated that Edward went further than either of them had ever been without scuba gear, and Sheck was ready to congratulate him when he broke the surface. But then when Edward turned to torpedo himself back to the surface, Sheck watched as he suddenly went limp and slowly dropped to the bottom. Sheck immediately descended to try to reach his brother, but Edward was unconscious and he kept falling deeper and deeper. So despite his best efforts, there was no way Sheck was going to be able to reach him without scuba equipment. So instead, he swam as fast as he could to the beach, hurried out of the water, and then ran to his car to grab an air tank he had in his trunk. But then as he was doing this, his body gave out on him. He collapsed from exhaustion after so many attempts to reach Edward on a single breath hold. Thankfully, there was a fellow swimmer nearby who grabbed Shaq's dive gear and entered the water to rescue him. The man descended and found Edward's limp body on the bottom of Wakulla Springs, but there was still a chance he could be saved, even if it was small. After the diver pulled Edward to the surface and got him onto the beach, Sheck started CPR in front of a gathering crowd. By then, Edward had already been at the bottom far longer than most could survive, but miraculously, Sheck managed to get him breathing again. At that point, an ambulance was unseen and rushed him to the nearest hospital where he was placed on life support. Tragically though, he was taken off of it later that night when it became clear that he had no brain activity. This was beyond devastating for Sheck. And so from that moment, he dedicated his life to establishing diving safety standards and protocols as a way to deal with his grief and ensure that neither his parents nor the parents of any other diver would ever have to suffer that kind of pain again. 
Over the next 26 years, this pursuit became an obsession, as did a more specialized type of diving. The first time Shaq entered an underwater cave, it was like love at first sight. At the time, it was a very new activity and cave diving was without a whole lot of training or safety standards. So from then on as well, Shaq became one of the foremost experts in the community. So much so that he literally wrote the book on cave diving. In 1979, he published his book, Basic Cave Diving, A Blueprint for Survival, which is still considered the how-to manual for the sport. The book focuses primarily on safety and emergencies, but beyond the book, he also became one of the most practiced, maybe even the most practiced cave divers ever. By 23, he had already logged more than 100 cave dives, and that number exploded to more than 4,000 by his mid-40s. But as much as Sheck loved adding to that total, it was extreme depth that brought out the ultimate competitor in him. And luckily for him, he seemed to have some rather unique abilities to withstand depth. The deeper a diver goes, the more risk grows. For starters, there's the crushing pressure of water at depth. As a diver descends, the weight of the water above increases. Go deep enough and the pressure of the water will squeeze anything not built to withstand those forces like an empty water bottle. The dangers aren't just external though. Internally, depth has a variety of impacts on the human body. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you've likely heard this explanation many times before, but bear with me because it's relevant to Sheck's insane abilities. Conditions like nitrogen narcosis and decompression sickness, or the bends, can set in fast and with little warning. As you go deeper, nitrogen in the bloodstream can build up too fast for the body to keep up with absorbing it. This then has a narcotic effect on the body and can cause a person to feel intoxicated, hence the name nitrogen narcosis. It's often described as similar to being drunk with a lot of the same impairments. Severe nitrogen narcosis though can bring on hallucinations, dizziness, and unconsciousness, all of which are obviously extremely hazardous hundreds of feet in the water. To combat this, divers will use different gas mixtures the deeper they go with less nitrogen than regular air. Weirdly though, Sheck seemed to be almost immune to narcosis. While serving as a member of the support team for two divers trying to break the air-only depth record in 1970, Sheck made it to 465 feet or 142 meters before he experienced any effects of narcosis. Sadly, the two divers he was assisting did not share that same resistance to narcosis and died during the attempt. Sheck was also the first person to ever dive below 800 feet or 240 meters in technical scuba diving, which is a feat that has only been attempted by 20 people in history as of 2021. And on top of his near immunity to narcosis, Sheck never once experienced a case of decompression sickness. Decompression sickness, or the bends, occurs when all that nitrogen that was absorbed into soft tissue on descent floods its way back into the bloodstream too quickly and creates bubbles. Most cases of the bends are not serious, but it can cause death if it's severe enough. The best way to avoid this is by making something known as a decompression stop during the ascent. The number and duration of these stops is determined by how deep a diver goes and how long they stay at that depth, since these variables determine how much nitrogen gets absorbed by the body. By stopping at specific depths and remaining there for a set amount of time, the nitrogen is released slowly and doesn't form large bubbles that can be a problem. As you might imagine, any diver with a resistance to these conditions has a serious advantage, so by 1994, Sheck had all three of the deepest dives of all time. A few years prior, Sheck had even broken his own record by diving 881 feet or 269 meters, but he knew he could go further still, he just needed somewhere to do it. It was around this time when his good friend and diving partner Jim Bowden told him about a place he believed had the deepest known sinkhole in the world. The cave that Jim was talking about is called Zakatone, and it's technically not a cave at all, it's a sinkhole called a cenote which is a cousin of the blue hole. Both blue holes and cenotes are created as bedrock of roads and collapses over time to expose groundwater. The only difference between the two is that blue holes are located near the ocean and cenotes are found inland. They're often referred to as caves since that's what they were before their ceilings fell in. When Shaq saw Zakatone for himself in 1993, his enthusiasm exploded. The otherwise stoic and mild-mannered math teacher was like a kid the moment he resurfaced from his first dive there. Almost right away, Sheck and Jim began planning and preparing for a dive that would take them to 1,000 feet or 305 meters and beyond. They spent the next year discussing and examining every single little detail. Everything had to be perfect. Calculations had to be made to determine the type, blend, and the amount of gas the dive would require. Practice dive after practice dive would also need to be done to ensure both men were not only physically but mentally prepared to operate safely at 1,000 feet or more. The result of their work was a solid and specific plan. They got their support team set with divers Ann Kristovich and Marcus Gary joining Sheck's wife Mary Ellen and Jim's wife Karen. 
they wouldn't enter directly through Zakaton since it was surrounded by tall rock faces on all sides. Instead, they would enter from a nearby spring and then swim through a 600 foot tunnel that connects the two. Before the dive, two weighted guide ropes were set up in the cenote that both men would use to descend and ascend. When they were ready, Jim would descend first and Shek would follow him after 10 seconds so they wouldn't collide since they would be dropping fairly quickly. Unlike ascending, the descent could be executed as quickly as a diver chooses, so they planned to drop to the bottom at a rate of 100 feet or 33 meters per minute. This meant the entire trip would take about 10 to 12 minutes. Such a fast descent would help reduce the amount of decompression time they'd need on the way up, since Sheck planned to just touch the bottom and then immediately begin ascending. This is because at the depth they were aiming for, spending even one minute there translated to hours of additional decompression stops. During the descent as well, they'd need to switch tanks and regulators on the fly once they reached specific depths. Incredibly, they planned to use six different mixtures of nitrogen, oxygen, and helium across over 30 tanks. To avoid narcosis and make decompression as fast as possible, this needed to be precise. But since no one had ever been to a thousand feet or beyond, it was uncharted territory. Because of this, Schacht worked with a physiologist to dial in the proper gas mixtures. And even though the plan called for Sheck to begin ascent immediately the moment he touched bottom, and with tanks staggered along their guide ropes with gas mixtures intended to shorten decompression stops, the return trip to the surface would still take about 10 hours and require 50 stops to complete. While they ascended, members of the support team would descend to specific depths to wait for Sheck and Jim and assist as needed. Finally, after everything was planned to perfection, they set a dive date of April 6, 1994, just six days after Sheck's 45th birthday. This was also when Sheck would be on spring break from teaching. But throughout the year of planning, despite the incredible physical shape he was in, Sheck spent a lot of time thinking about his future in diving. He was another year older, and the invincibility of his 20s and 30s was fading, which was something he found out abruptly. While diving a freshwater sinkhole in South Africa called Bushman's Hole in 1993, Sheck had the first real underwater scare of his career. He was attempting to reach 863 feet, or 263 meters, when the helium in his tanks started to turn on him. This is because divers at extreme depths are at risk of another condition. In addition to nitrogen narcosis, they also have to worry about a condition called High Pressure Nervous Syndrome, or HPNS. Like narcosis and decompression sickness, HPNS is reversible but comes on suddenly with potentially debilitating symptoms. It can set in anywhere below 500 feet or 150 meters while breathing helium. The effects are also highly individual and based on variables like how much helium is in a diver's mix, how deep they dive, and the rate of descent. During the 1960s, HPNS was first documented by a US Navy physiologist who called the effects helium tremors since violent shaking is one of the most common symptoms. HPNS can also cause extreme sleepiness, changes in heart rate and rhythm, and decreased mental functioning. Sheck's descent into Bushman's Hole was also performed at a rate of 100 feet per minute, and Sheck began to tremble around 700 feet. Then his vision suddenly turned into countless tiny circles, each with black dots in the center, and his skin became intensely itchy before transitioning into a stinging feeling. With all of that going on, he continued his descent to 863 feet, at which point his tremors were too bad to continue. He managed to begin his ascent and stopped at 750 feet to allow his body to adjust, but it was no use. The only thing that would reverse his HPNS was to keep going higher. Finally, he was able to get the symptoms to stop, but the experience scared him. Even before then, he never viewed himself as immortal and he was well aware of the potential dangers that exist deep underwater, but those moments in Bushman's Hole caused Sheck to start questioning whether it was time to step away from the extreme depth record chasing. It was something he had thought about constantly since then, and when he came to a decision, he announced to the diving community that his upcoming dive at Zakaton would be his last extreme depth dive. Crossing the 1000 foot or 305 meter threshold was the perfect note to go out on. When April 6 arrived, Sheck, Jim, and the support team made the drive to Zakaton to make their final preparations. After learning about Sheck's world record attempt and that it would be his last extreme dive, several sports publications and a small TV news channel were on the scene to report on the attempt. When everything was ready to go, Sheck and Jim entered the water and made it through the tunnel that connected the spring to the sinkhole. As they surfaced inside Zakaton, they couldn't help but notice the growing crowd of farmers and locals on the surrounding cliffs. There's not a whole lot to see during a cave dive for those on land, but people who live nearby weren't going to miss a world record attempt anyway. Sheck and Jim were appreciative of the interest, but didn't let the presence of the crowd distract them. As they bobbed up and down at the surface, both men closed their eyes and started to meditate. They played the entire dive out in their mind's eye while they slowed their breathing to just a few breaths per minute. Then, as if they could sense each other's readiness, they opened their eyes at the same time and Sheck nodded to his partner. At 9.45am that morning, Jim disappeared under the water with Shaq right behind him. 
On the descent, they were on compressed air to 300 feet, or 91 meters. At that point, they switched to a gas called Healy air, a term Shack coined, which is just helium mixed with regular air. At 600 feet, or 183 meters, they switched again, this time to Trimix, which is a combination of nitrogen, oxygen, and helium. If you're wondering how they were able to switch back and forth between so many gases, it's because they were strapped with 200 pounds of gas tanks, which also conveniently helped their rapid descent. When Jim started to slow his descent at the 750 foot mark, this is when the first problem began. Jim began involuntarily trembling. He didn't know it at the time, but his rate of descent was much faster than planned, which meant he had been breathing too much helium far deeper than he should have. As the trembling grew, Jim had no doubt that HPNS was setting in, and it was only going to get worse the deeper he went. But then when he looked over towards Sheck's rope, Jim saw Sheck's light descending past him toward the bottom. This meant that he had to keep descending. Then at 900 feet or 274 meters, Jim checked his air gauges and was stunned by how much trimix he had already consumed. There's always some variance with gas calculations, but they usually aren't big enough to impact the dive or the diver. This was a pretty big discrepancy though. With one tank of trimix already finished, the second tank was only showing 1000 psi, meaning he was already about two thirds of the way through supply. But even worse, if the pressure dropped below 500 psi, gas would stop flowing through his regulator. He needed to ascend right away. So, at 925 feet, Jim inflated his buoyancy device, or BCD. Jim's rest computer then set his first decompression stop at 450 feet. By the time he reached that mark, the last of his mix was gone, and so was his Healy air supply. Fortunately, there was a tank of decompression gas waiting there for him. As if things couldn't get any worse, when he opened the valve on that tank, gas shot through the regulator, causing it to fly out of his mouth. Thinking quickly, he switched the regular connected to the compressed air tanks on his back while he tried to fix the regular as it flailed in the water from the force of the gas leaving the tank. After messing with it for a while, he just couldn't get the regular fixed, so he was left with only one option. He had to put the tank under his arm and continue to ascend as he opened and closed the valve when he needed to breathe. It was an agonizing process in an already challenging environment, and making matters worse was that Jim would need to make several decompression stops before he reached the next tank at 300 feet. When he finally got there, he ditched the tank with the faulty regular for a new tank with one that worked. Finally, he was able to breathe a sigh of relief and turned his attention back towards Sheck. On the surface, the support team kept a close eye on the bubbles rising from the water. About two minutes after Sheck and Jim went under, the bubbles disappeared, which indicated they were beyond a ledge that jutted out at around 250 feet. Based on the plan and the extensive calculations done, once the bubble stopped rising to the surface, they should reappear within 12 to 18 minutes. And right on time, one set of bubbles broke the surface above Jim's rope, but not Sheck's. Knowing that Sheck would be diving deeper than Jim, the team expected to see Jim's bubbles first, and then a delay before bubbles would reappear above Sheck's rope. But as time ticked by without any sign of Sheck, the team grew concerned. One of the support divers, Anne, went back to the spring, grabbed her tanks, and began making her way through the tunnel to meet up with Jim and find out what was going on. Back in the water on Jim's journey from 250 feet to 170, he looked over at Sheck's rope and expected to see it taut and moving, but it was just slack and still. He looked down and saw nothing but blackness. There were no lights and no bubbles. Realizing what this might mean, he had a brief moment of panic, but he managed to convince himself that Sheck was just further behind than expected. When he reached his next decompression stop though, he saw Anne was waiting there for him and he could sense her worry. While they waited together for Jim's decompression stop to end, they fixed their eyes on Sheck's rope just hoping to see any sign of life. On the cliffs surrounding the sinkhole, Sheck's wife Mary Ellen hadn't realized anything was out of the ordinary until she noticed the others were gone. Then she walked to the spring where she found Jim's wife Karen and the other support diver Marcus looking distraught. Karen then approached Mary Ellen and gave her the news that Sheck might be in trouble, but she was barely finished the sentence before Mary Ellen was in the water and on her way through the tunnel. When she made it to Anne and Jim, she scrawled a message on her whiteboard telling them that she was going to go look for Sheck at 250 feet. She then reached the ledge at that depth and expected to see Sheck's light at the very least by that point, but there was nothing but the same blackness below her that Jim saw. She dropped off the ledge and descended a bit further, but without the right gas to continue, she had to turn around. After Mary Ellen entered the water, Karen followed behind her and remained at 100 feet to meet her. When Mary Ellen got back up to her, Karen could see that she was in tears. Mary Ellen tried to continue ascending, but Karen grabbed her wrist to see how far she descended while trying to find Sheck. She saw that Mary Ellen had to decompress for 30 minutes before it was safe to surface. Karen then held Mary Ellen in her arms and they remained like that for the entire stop. On the banks of the spring, one of the photographers noticed bubbles rising in the water and lifted his camera to his face. As he shot photos of Karen and Mary Ellen surfacing and exiting the water, he noticed that they were both sobbing when they pulled their masks off. 
He then put his camera back down as Mary Ellen let out a scream of pure grief that would haunt anyone who heard it. Long after the others had returned to the surface, Jim was still in the midst of a decompression process that still had hours remaining. During this, one of the support team divers met Jim at his decompression stop around 60 feet and confirmed what Jim already knew. Sheck was gone. To that point, Jim held on to the slim hope that Sheck was just behind schedule and still working his way up, but with that confirmation, the hope was gone. Jim wanted to be anywhere other than being suspended at decreasing depth for hours, but going to the surface before his decompression stops were complete was dangerous. He had no choice but to remain underwater with his own thoughts for as long as it would take. Finally, after almost 10 hours, Jim emerged from the water alone. The shock among everyone surrounding Zakaton became almost tangible as word spread. It was a scenario that was always a possibility, but no one really thought there would be a dive that Shek wouldn't return from. For a few days, no one even really knew what to do, but eventually the support team and some locals had to return to Zakaton to retrieve the equipment. When one of the team went to pull Shek's rope up, it was too heavy since there were still unused bottles tied to it for Shek's ascent. So as a team, they worked to pull up more than a thousand feet of rope with a considerable amount of weight tied to it. Then, as it broke the surface, they realized that at the end of it was Shek's body. What exactly happened to Shek that day will never fully be known, but there are a couple of theories. Maybe the most likely is that Shek had another HPNS event. The physiologist who assisted Shek theorized that he likely didn't die as a direct result of HPNS, but if the tremors were violent enough, it's possible that he lost his regulator and drowned. Another possibility is that despite Shek's thoroughness, the gas mixtures could have just been wrong. Too much nitrogen can cause narcosis, too much helium can fry the nervous system, and too much oxygen at too deep a depth can become toxic. The consequences are just as dire if any of the gases are too low as well. If anything was far off enough, it could have caused any number of conditions with the potential to incapacitate him. How Shek became tangled in the rope wasn't clear either, but the way that he was attached to it looked far more intentional than accidental. There's some speculation that Shek knew he was going to die and that he tied the rope to himself so his body could be recovered without putting anyone else in danger. A week after being retrieved from Zakaton, Shek was celebrated by his family, friends, and the entire diving community that was grateful for the work he did to make their shared passion safer. He was then buried next to his brother, Edward, in Jacksonville, Florida. In a cruel twist given the circumstances, when Jim left the water on that fateful day, he did so as the new world record holder for the deepest dive on a self-contained breathing apparatus, beating the record Shek both set and was attempting to break when he died. Today, only five people on Earth have ever been to a thousand feet underwater, but none would have accomplished the feat if not for Shek and his contributions to cave diving. The current depth record is 1,090 feet, or 332 meters, set in 2014. Hello everyone, and welcome to Scary Interesting. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. And once again, a huge thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check them out using the link in the description for 60% off a subscription. And hopefully, I will see you in the next one.